Good morning, Higher Ground. I have joining me this morning in the baptistry, Ayla Sintel. And Ayla has invited Christ into her life to be her personal Savior and Lord, and she has come today to follow him in believer's baptism. So, Ayla, upon your profession of faith in Christ and your obedience to him, it is my honor today to baptize you as my sister in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried with Christ and raised to walk in the newness of life. This is Lincoln Sintel. So yes, this is brothers and sisters. They're not only now brother and sister biologically, but they're now brothers and sisters in the Lord as well. So Lincoln, upon your profession of faith in Christ and your obedience to him, it's my honor today to baptize you as my brother in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Bear with Christ, raised to walk in the newness of life. Amen.
You may be seated. Sing this with us. What a wonderful change in my life.
Renew is what we're hearing a lot about around our church these days. It's a two-headed campaign. Repair the house, which is a reference to physical needs, to our buildings and so on. And as I noted earlier, we've got a special offering coming up for that next Sunday. But there is also the Renew the Heart. And that centers around a renewal of our heart with Christ and a renewal of certain areas of ministry like Sunday school and others. So today I want to shift back toward the renewal of the heart thought. And, and I want to put the bullseye this morning on this idea here. A renewal of our heart for our own personal growth and development as a disciple of Jesus Christ. So for me to set this message up in the introduction, I need for us to read the passage very first thing. So I want to invite you to stand in honor of God's holy word. And I want to begin in cha excuse me, chapter 1, verse 23, all the way in to chapter 2 uh, through verse 3. Now you might add, that's kind of odd, Pastor, that we go from one chapter into the other. Well, you do understand that in the original manuscripts, there are no chapter verse divisions. And sometimes I would be willing to say there's unfortunate chapter and verse divisions. Somebody has said that the man that was dividing the verses was on a horse, and as he was right, every time he would go down, he would make a verse. Every time he would go down. So sometimes um, we like to look at the text as it's written in paragraph form, and that will take us from one chapter into the next, and that's one of these occasions this morning. So, verse 23 says, Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass." The grass withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And then we have this connecting verse here in verse 1 that lets us know something that's about to be said is predicated on something that was just said. So he says this, Wherefore, laying aside of all malice, and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. As newborn babes desire the milk, the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. If so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You can be seated this morning. Thank you for standing in honor of God's word. This passage this morning is ultimately about growth. Not church growth, but personal, individual growth. Verse 2 ends with the phrase that ye may grow thereby. Growth, therefore, is the thrust of this passage, and it's what we'll be looking at today. That word growth um, in the original language is the word oxano. It means to enlarge or to increase. But it is also a passive verb, in other words, literally meaning it may grow you. He's just referenced the Word, and then he says it is ultimately by the Word in which any of us will grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. Of course, this is talking about the effect of the Word of God on your life. There is no substitute um, for growing as a child of God other than by exposure to an application of the Scripture, the Holy Word of God. But really, as you look at what's being taught in chapter 2, you begin to understand that this is one long flowing thought. In fact, the, third, the first three verses are one long sentence. 
uh, the statement on growth in verse 2 is kind of the hinge verse, if you will. All of what's being said is some way connected to growth and to God's Word. So suffice it to say, dear church, we are talking about personal growth today. As a matter of fact, the title for the message is The Road to Growth. It's a subject that needs to be talked about because it is seemingly so absent by and large from the body of Christ. It's always sad to me to see a human being physically malnourished. We don't see it as often here in the States, though I do know it, is, it does happen, but as I've traveled around the world in countries like, let's just say, um, Haiti or, or Africa in particular, um, it is very, very apparent when you see a child, or an adult for that matter, who is physically malnourished. You, you can tell just simply by the, the sunken in face and the, what, what just looks like exasperation on, on their, 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 their faces, and you see it in their bodies. You can tell that they're not as, you know, as virile as you might think a, a person would be. But listen to me, sadder still is seeing believers who are spiritually malnourished and underdeveloped. Uh, unfortunately, that has become an accepted norm in so many of our churches, but I pray it wouldn't be an accepted norm here at Higher Ground Baptist Church. We need to break through that curse and be motivated by the opportunity we have to grow strong and mature in Christ and enjoy the greater blessings of greater usefulness because of an ascending maturity. So before we get to talking about growth, we need to understand that verses 23 through 25 are set up verses for chapter 2. There is no debate that the Word of God is the Holy Spirit's primary tool. Listen, not just a tool, but primary tool for bringing about uh, maturity in your life. Also, however, it shows us that it was the Word of God that was sufficient for salvation also. And it will be sufficient for your sanctification as well. So with that in mind, if you're a note taker this morning, there are several things I want you to see. Here's the first one. The first thing I want us to give our attention to this morning is what I'm just simply calling the eternal word. The eternal word. If we're talking about a road that leads to growth, then this right here is the foundation for that road. This reminds us when we're out on the highway and we see a new road going in or an old road being repaired and you see them bringing in load after load of that old orange clay dirt, you know what I'm talking about, and you've got those big heavy machinery uh, rolling across that dirt, they'll wet it down and they'll roll over it and pack it, and they'll do that over and over again and add more. They're building a roadbed before the cement or the asphalt ever shows up because the cement and the asphalt will only have longevity if the foundation is right. So you see, what we're doing here in verses 23 through 25 is we're rem being reminded of what the foundation of not only our growth is, but our salvation. In verse 23, Peter is contrasting how an earthly father initiates human birth, which is with his, and I quote, corruptible seed. When a man fertilizes the egg of a woman... He does so with a seed that is tainted with sin. It is corrupt. Just as he received corruption from his great, 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 great grandparents named Adam and Eve, he then transfers that corrupt seed to the next generation and thereby perpetuates the sinfulness of, hum of the human race. You see, that seed will eventually die. Because the Bible says it is appointed unto man once to die, and then after this, the judgment. So in complete contrast to that, we have the way also in which the Heavenly Father gives birth to His children. The Spirit of God plants the incorruptible seed, that's the language that is used, uh, of the Word of God. 
He plants the incorruptible seed of the Word of God into a life that brings about a born-again experience. The idea being portrayed for us clearly in James chapter 1, verse 18, when James says, Of his own will he brought us forth by the word of truth. You see, church, it is this eternal word that makes this happen in our life. Salvation, eternal as well. The Word of God is eternal, so therefore, so is our salvation. And the author of the eternal Word of God, the Lord Jesus Christ Himself, is eternal. There has never been a time when Jesus was not. It was Jesus Himself that spoke the words of creation to where this world came into existence. He's eternal. His Word is eternal, so therefore our salvation is eternal. Eternal salvation is the product of the eternal Word's work in our life. To illustrate this in verse 24 and 25, we have Peter quoting Isaiah chapter 4, verse 6 and verse 8. This speaks of the transient nature of life. He talks about grass. He talks about flowers that bloom. You see, he refers to our flesh just like grass. He refers to the glory of a man like a flower. The grass was just common wild grass that, that um, grew in the Middle Eastern countryside. And sometimes a, a beautiful wildflower would arise above the grass in beautiful splendor. Uh, listen, what is he saying? He's saying whether something or somebody is as common as a blade of grass, or as uniquely lovely as a flower, it eventually falls off or withers. In other words, it dies. All of our beauty, whatever degree we may or may not possess, will die. Fit bodies of youth are soon subjected to the onslaught of age, and we literally wither. Instead of withering heights, it's withering depths. You with me? You say, dear God, Pastor, I got out of bed on a cold May morning, drove all the way to church for you to say nothing more to me than I'm withering away. Yep, it's pretty much the case. We are all withering. It's the nature of human nature because of the incorruptible seed that is our flesh. But in contrast to that, the Word of God and its work will live on for us, in us, forever. That's why Paul said that the outward man may be declining and deteriorating, but the inward man is being renewed day by day. The old shell, you see these, these bodies we have are just shells, aren't they? I, I grew up in South Alabama, so we used to go to the beach all the time, and uh, fortunately, or every once in a while, fortunately, you would, you would uh, discover one of those little circular shells. I don't even know what they're called, but, you know, there's a little dude that lives up in there. And trust me, you want to get him out before you take it home. Because you're going to take him out of the water, and he's going to die, and he's going to stink to high heaven. And you're going to have forgotten about it and left it in the trunk, and you're going to open it up in a few days, and you're going to think, what in the world happened to my car? You see, that shell didn't... It didn't. It wasn't the life. It just contained the life. That's what these bodies are. They're not the life. They just contain the life. So they continue to decline and they continue to go downhill. But the inner person is strengthened day by day and can grow stronger in contrast to these physical bodies. You see, church, this old book right here is not going anywhere. It has made it into and has survived in the most hostile situations. Anytime we are able to get into a country that has, has historically been, you know, hostile to Christianity, communist countries, etc., when we get in there, we always discover that the Word of God, Bibles, are prevalent. Bibles are there. You see, what I'm saying is you cannot extinguish the Word of God. 
The French atheist Voltaire once proclaimed that in 25 years, the Bible would be forgotten and Christianity would be a thing of the past. Forty years after his death in 1778, the Bible and other Christian literature was then being printed in what had once been Voltaire's very own home, his own residence. You see, his grass withered and his flower faded, but the Word of God continued to stand and still stands and will always stand. Amen? So the last part of verse 25 says, And this is the Word which by the gospel is preached unto you. You see, this is what we preach. The eternal Word of God, the eternal gospel of Jesus Christ. In the name of creativity and in the name of being on the cutting edge and in the name of being contemporary, a contemporary communicator, we've moved the church, you see, from offering the, the, the eternal substituted by the temporal. No, no, we must preach the eternal truth of the gospel. We don't need 15-minute TED Talks from the pulpit. We need a man who will open up the Word of God and preach the unsearchable riches of Christ because that is the only thing that brings people from death into life. It is through the Word of God. Now, with that established, Peter then moves more toward marking out this road of growth for us. So we see the eternal word. We see its place in salvation. And now we're going to see more fully its place in sanctification. So notice, secondly, this road to growth is marked by at least three elements. Here's the second point, but the first one for the road. And it is this. The elimination of sin. The elimination of sin. Verse 1 of chapter 2. Wherefore, based on the fact now that we're saved, born again by the, by the Spirit of God, through the message of the Word of God, wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings. You see, this is a verse of Scripture that is describing both a means and an end. You see, repenting of sin is both the means to growth and the end result of growth. We can't grow until we get rid of sin, and when we grow, we get rid of sin. <laughs> now, I guess we could spend the rest of the morning trying to figure out which comes first, which I want to go ahead and tell you that pursuit would not be profitable to us because it does not matter. The important thing for us is to know that we should lay aside all sin. The things that he mentions here, he, he notes some sins, they are not exhaustive. In other words, he doesn't mention every potential sin that any person could be participating in, but they are very representative of evil and perhaps even reflect Peter's personal knowledge, perhaps about his audience even, we don't know. But I want to mention each one of these, but, but I won't go into lengthy detail because we just won't have time to do that. But first one he mentions is malice, the word kakia. It actually is an all-inclusive Greek word referring to general wickedness. It's kind of an umbrella term. All, wicked, all wickedness could just fit under this title of malice. Guile, dolos, it means to bait. In other words, to deceive someone. You know what? You fishermen know what it means to bait that hook, right? You want to, and this is a great subject for Sunday morning, you want to run that worm up over that hook. You don't want it shining. You don't want it seen. You don't want him to taste the hook first. You want him to taste the worm first. You know what I'm talking about, right? What are you trying to do? You're trying to deceive. All great fishermen are great deceivers. It's true. Brother, maybe you'd have caught more fish if you was a little bit more deceitful. Amen. Talking about falsehood. <laughs> I heard you, brother. Talking about dishonesty. Talking about treachery. And then he mentions hypocrisy. Uh, the hypocrite was um, an actor in Greek plays and dramas. And 
the hypocrite would play several different parts and he would have all these different masks. So the hypocrite, when he's playing one part, he'd hold this mask up. When he's playing another part, he'd hold this mask up. And there's a takeoff of that in the New Testament, as you've seen it. The hypocrite is a person who wears a variety of masks. When they're with this group of per people over here, they wear one mask. They've got a mask for Sunday. They've got a mask for Monday. They've got a mask for Friday, etc. They're not real. They're not genuine. They're not true-faced. They're two-faced. He talks about envy. It describes the attitude of those who would resent the prosperity of others. We learn a lot more about ourselves, not how we respond to people who are in dire needs. We respond... Uh, we learn more about ourselves, about how we respond to people who are doing well. Are we envious of the success that they're enjoying? And then he mentions evil speaking, catalalias. It means to slander. It refers to backbiting and gossip and defamation of character. Now, Peter could have gone on and on and on with a more exhaustive list. Point being is this. For growth to really take hold in your life and mine... There must be an expulsion of any sin. Let me ask you some questions here. Don't answer out loud. What are you dealing with right now? I feel very comfortable or confident today in saying and making this statement, everybody is dealing with something. There is some besetting sin that if you're not very careful and guarded in your life, you know, I know, the devil knows, God knows that it will eat your lunch. Can I get a witness? It might be some form of lust. It might be some form of, of anger or unforgiveness. It could be your thought life. It could be dishonesty. It could be your tongue. It could be anything. And let me say this, you're not going any farther for the Lord or with the Lord until you get that taken care of. What does the Bible say here? Lay aside. That, that phrase, lay aside, was emblematic of a change of clothes. It reminds us of what Paul taught in Ephesians where he says we must put off the old wardrobe and we must put on the new wardrobe. Hey, he's not talking about Calvin Klein or any other brand name. He's talking about putting off fully the old life and putting on the new man. You see, the wardrobe that most of the church is wearing won't take them to where they need to go. It won't take them into the green pastures that God has for them. You see, dear friends, what we need today is a good old-fashioned spiritual house cleaning where we don't sweep the dirt of our sin up under the rug, but we remove it in Jesus' name. You say that's hard. Yes, it's hard because even though you're saved and have a new nature, it's still incarcerated in your unredeemed flesh. That's why you have to put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. That's why you have to walk in the Spirit so you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's why you put to death the deeds of the flesh by the Spirit. Oh, listen. Somebody said... That the whole church, instead of the world going after the church, that the whole church is now going after the world. I think it's true. You see, there must be for you and I to grow an elimination of sin. Now let me move to the second point. And these are all interconnected. Point number three, but second mark of the road to growth is this. The eagerness for the Word. The eagerness for the Word. Desire for an eagerness for the Word of God is one of the staple marks of a growing Christian. Listen to this. John 8, 31. If you abide in my Word, then you are truly disciples of mine. Job 23, 12. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2. When it's speaking of the godly man, it says of him that his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in it he meditates both day and night. The question for all of us is, do we desire the Word? Are we eager for it? Do we long for it? Do we treasure it above other pursuits? Now, verse 3 describes this desire. Listen to this. Like a baby that desires milk. That is the dominant pursuit of a, of a newborn baby. Now, this does not mean that Peter 
viewed his readers as young or baby Christians. For some of them, we know by the date of the epistle to of 1 Peter, we know that some of these believers had been believers for 30 years. He's simply saying that they were to long for the Word in the same way that new babies long for milk. This metaphor is easily understood by any parent who has had their sleep interrupted in the middle of the night with the cries of a hungry baby wanting some milk. It's a terrible sound. It was always a great inconvenience when it would wake me up and I had to roll over and tell Julie that the baby wanted her. <laughs> Seriously, though, we understand this, don't we? We understand this. A baby desires milk. And if they don't get it, they will wail and cry until they do. Listen to me very carefully. Now, we can't miss this. He didn't command us here to read the Word, study the Word. He didn't command us to meditate on the Word. He didn't command us to teach the Word, preach the Word, or search the Word, or memorize the Word. Rather, he focused on the foundational element, which is desire which all believers need before they will pursue the Word over other things. Now, track with me. Here's the place where I need to jump back and connect verse 1 and verse 2. Now, a, a child in general, if you let a child eat whatever a child wants to eat, you all know this, they'll never eat anything healthy for themselves again. They would be completely satisfied to munch on candy and cake and ice cream. And you know, they say as you get older, it's a reversion back to childhood. And I can tell you, as I'm getting older, my, my tooth is getting sweeter. Ice cream is absolute kryptonite for me. I, I, Julie and I are, are both, we say, you cannot buy it and put it in our house. Because I lay down at night and I can hear it from the kitchen, Richard, I'm right here. You went to bed without checking with me. You know what I'm saying? So a child, not, not, oh, I'm going somewhere with this. A child would fill up on junk food if you let them. Their whole appetite would be sated with junk food. This is where verse 1 comes into play. The reason God's children don't have an appetite for the Word of God is because we're too often filling up on other things. That's why verse 1 says that you got to get all the junk out of your life, have a spiritual spring cleaning, lay aside all of that sin that is robbing you of a ferocious appetite for the Word of God. You see, sin and the things and the trinkets of this world are a placebo for actually having the appetites of your life actually satisfied. You see, you'll try to satisfy yourself on, on sin or some other little toy or trinket, and you're going to discover that spiritually you're going to be starving to death and you're not even going to know it. That's why he's saying that our desire has to be right. Listen, strive to eliminate sins is a prerequisite to sustaining a desire for God's Word. Clinging to sin drives one in the opposite direction from the truth that exposes and confronts sin and demands righteousness. Let me point out something else here. He says that we should desire the sincere or pure milk of the Word. That word, uh, sincere, is the word adalus. It means unadulterated or uncontaminated. Simply put, we should desire the pure Word. Breaking down a text like we're doing right here this morning is the creme de la creme of our life. We don't need flashing lights. We don't need videos. We don't need TV shows to somehow make this interesting. The Word of God stands on its own. 
Just the pure word is fine with me. When I get up in the mornings to spend time with Jesus, look, I might read Spurgeon's morning and evening as a supplement to something that I'm doing. But listen, what I want to do is open up the book and study it just like I'm preaching it to you this morning. And I might read seven verses, eight, ten verses, and I just want to go through there and find out every morsel of truth that God has for me and how it comes to bear on my soul and how there's a promise for me to hang on to and how there's a foundation for me to stand upon and how there's a sin for me to avoid. The pure milk of God's Word. John MacArthur makes a very astute observation when he says this. He says, in view of postmodern culture's relentless output of informational junk food through radio, television, films, and the Internet, computer games, books, periodicals, and even so-called pulpits, all of which causes malnourishment and dulls appetites for genuine spiritual food, believers must commit to a regular nourishment from God's Word. There's more information, more things out there for supposed Christians than there's ever been. And I don't care if it's a Lifeway Christian bookstore that don't even exist anymore, so that's not a good illustration. But I wouldn't give you a plug nickel for about 90% of what's in those stores. You ask me, Pastor, are there some good books that we ought to read? There are with the Bible being the preeminent one, of course. And I'll tell you this, read the dead guys. Read those that wrote a long time ago where it's tried and true. Now, there's some good authors today, and I can load your plow if you want some. But read stuff that has meat to it. Let's stick with the pure milk of God's Word. Creativity is overrated. Modernization is overrated. Media is overrated. We need the pure milk of the Word apart from the distractions of all these other things. Now, as I move on to this last point, I need to keep the connection with this verse because they work off one another, okay? See, what I'm trying to teach you this morning, this is what I'm showing you, this is the danger of just lifting out a verse out of a passage and not really dealing with it in the context of the passage in which it's in. All these verses work together. So here's the final one. The road to growth, listen to this one. I'm calling it the evaluation of life. The evaluation of life. Now, as I start this point, I want to go back to the last one. Eagerness for the Word. That's what we're commanded to do, to have desire for the Word. How is that possible? Can you command somebody to have desire? <laughs> I mean, what you find out is that verses 1, 2, and 3 are interconnected. I think verse 2 is critical to the understanding then of verse 3. Because he says, essentially, if we're indeed born again and have tasted of the graciousness, graciousness and the goodness of God... Verse 3 has a very interesting Greek nuance to it. It begins with the word if. That makes it sound as if there's a possibility of someone being saved and not having tasted of the goodness and gracious heart of God. But that's not the case. If is what is referred to in the Greek as a first-class conditional participle. This simply means that he's stating a fact. It's not a if, like if it had warmed up today, we might grill something out by the pool, okay? That's not what he's saying. He is stating a fact. It would be better said in English, since you have tasted the goodness of God, or for you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. You see, these readers had experienced the marvelous and matchless grace of Jesus Christ. They had tasted the forgiveness of sins and the redemption of their souls. In other words, they had already tasted of the goodness of God. And what his whole point is, connecting that back to verse 2, he's saying this should spur you on to greater desire for the Word of God. They should desire more of the goodness of God by feeding on that goodness through His Word. How do you know how good God is? By what He has self-revealed. That's how. 
This book right here is not just a collection of a bunch of stories. It's God's revelation of himself to mankind. And it's complete and it's thorough. Any revelation about God that is not affirmed by this book is not of God. We learn more of him and who he is through this book. So you, should, you and I should regularly survey the blessings of salvation on our life. Remind yourself about the answers of prayer. Remind yourself about the times that he has touched your life with kindness and mercy. Remind yourself of when his strength had been mediated to your life. Remind yourself of the hope and the confidence for eternity and countless others that we have through this book that will cultivate in you a desire in your heart for the Word of God, which is God's means to continue to mediate his grace to your life and family. Now, I like to eat. I'm going to do that here in just a little while. And I'm a little like a catfish in that I'll just, I'll just about eat anything. There's only two, of the, two or three things in my life that's in the, on the no-fly zone list, okay? And I love steak. I'm as carnivorous as a person could possibly be. If there's not some meat on the plate, I really haven't eaten. I've just done something to hold me over till I can get my hands and mouth on some meat. You know what I'm saying? I don't care, red meat, white meat, I don't care. I like it all. But I love steak. I mean, I love it. I'm telling you, I like it cooked to perfection so that when you cut into it, you hear a little faint moo. <laughs> Amen? It needs to be good and red and juicy. Do you know how I came to like steak? By eating my first one. Right? I tasted, and I realized, Brother Barry, it's good. It's good. And ever since that first one that I've tasted, I've wanted to taste that just about as many times as I possibly can. The only thing that hinders me tasting it regularly is just the budget. Because they're proud of them cows, you know what I'm saying? You see, when you got saved through the incorruptible seed of God's Word being placed in you, you tasted and found out that the Lord is good. So to cultivate that desire, you remind yourself over and over again that you've already tasted of it, and it drives you back to the Word of God so that you can taste a little more and a little more and a little more. Theologian Wayne Grudem says this. He says, to drink the milk of the Word is to taste again and again what He is like. For in hearing of the Lord's words, believers experience the joy of personal fellowship with the Lord Himself. The more you taste, the more you'll want to taste. And ever since that first bite of steak, I can't get enough of that. You understand? And ever since the day I got saved, my appetite for Jesus was incited, and it is unquenchable. Now, don't get me wrong. In every person's walk with Jesus, there's peaks and valleys and hills and, and low points and times where we're in and we're out and times when we're more hungry and less hungry and all. I get all that, okay? I would like to say that our, our growth trajectory would just be on a curve or just on a trajectory just like that, but we all know it's a little bit more like this, is, is it not? So I'm not talking about, listen, the, the common ebbs and flows of the Christian walk and the battles that we all face, but I'm just simply saying, as a general rule of thumb, I tasted Jesus and I cannot get enough of Him. So it drives me back to His Word. The road to growth. We all need a renewal of our commitment to growth. Are you on the road? Or have you run off the road and crashed? Or stalled? You feel like, Pastor, you know, I, I, I've been through a season and, and I'm stalled or, or I'm just in a heap on the side of the road. I'm not going anywhere. Well, I tell you what, God will send his tow truck if you'll call on him. He'll pull you out. 
and he'll get you back on the road. You say, I don't have a desire for the word like I have in the past. Well, let me ask you this. Do you have a desire for the desire? If you do, by God's grace, he'll take you back to what tastes good. He'll remind you what tastes good. And it'll renew your appetite and you'll find yourself re-engaged with the Lord in his word and personally growing again. We need that renewal as well. Eliminate sin. What in your life needs to go? Eager for the word, do you desire it? If you're not desiring it, what is it that you're filling up on as a substitute? And then number two or three, evaluate the blessings of God. You've tasted, so keep tasting. Voice on a shelf.